Okay, welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, today is a very special meetup and it's all Maritza's fault. <laughs> I, I asked Maritza, you know, Maritza has been making such amazing uh, remarks, amazing comments through across many, many meetups. So I said, okay, we need to do some, some meetup. You know, I want you to do some meetup and choose whatever topic. And she says, I would like to do meetups about Ayn Rand. I said, sure. Now I have lots of friends who are, who really know about Ayn Rand. And so what I want to do, what I really want to do is to do meetups on Romantic Manifesto because I think that is the best nonfiction work of Ayn Rand and it is just revolutionary. So that's something um, that I want to do meetups on. So this is a preparatory meetup for that. So I want to get into it slowly. So we're going to be talking today about the Fountainhead and then we're going to start this Saturday is going to be the first meetup on the Romantic Manifesto, um, where we'll do an introduction to Romantic Manifesto. Then we'll take a break for Thanksgiving. And then two weeks from Saturday, we are going to go through the book chapter by chapter. I think it's 11 chapters. Um, and it's going to be something spectacular. Now, I don't know how to do today's meetup because the panelists here know the subject so well. And they have so much to say. I could talk to each of them for 24 hours and sometimes I have. So um, I don't know how to do this. So here is the format. So we've got incredible panelists. We've got Marissa, Joya, Shari and Rob. We've got four panelists. So what we're going to do is that I'm going to do a brief introduction about the Fountainhead, my own experience with Fountainhead. And then I'm going to give an open-ended question of whatever they want, whatever the panelists, each of the panelists want to say about Fountainhead between two to 10 minutes. Then each panelist gets to put a question on the table for the other panelist, and then I'll open it up for Q&A. Um, firstly, I would like to know how many of you have read, are very familiar with Fountainhead. So in chat, if you are familiar, just say yes. Okay, uh, if you're not familiar, say no. Okay, so um, very good, very good. If you're very familiar with uh, Fountainhead, um, again, you know, when we come to the part about questions, keep it to questions. At this point, uh, don't do um, commentary. And if you're not familiar, just listen. Just let people who know the book, uh, you know, ask about the book so you get an idea uh, about what this book has to offer. Okay, um, and then in the breakout rooms, you, we can do discussions uh, across everybody. And then you can, even if you're not heard uh, anything about Fountain, that you can share your takeaways during the takeaway. And then again, we'll keep the takeaways short so we can look at some themes. I'm actually very excited because, you know, Rob and Sherry are my old friends and Whenever I go to Thanksgiving with them, I just talk incessantly. Uh, so this is this is what this is what it's going to likely to happen. I've chosen a time when their kids have gone to bed or they are in their bedroom, so I can talk to them. So this is what it is for me. Plus, we've got you know I've got Maritza and Joya to add to the conversation. So it's going to be an amazing conversation. So let me go ahead and jump into it. Um, ever since I was a kid. I've been a voracious reader. And one question that I asked anybody I liked was, what's your favorite book? Okay. And there was this cousin of mine who said, you know, there is this guy called Ayn Rand who glorifies man's mind. Okay. And this phrase glorifies man's mind stuck in my head. So next time I was at a library, I saw this book by this guy. Fountainhead, and I picked it up. I was around 17 or 18, and I was back in India. Um, I was still trying to figure out, you know, I was trying to really figure out at that point what I wanted to do with my life. And Indian culture is a very traditional culture. And there, people don't even ask the question, what do I want to do with my life? That's not considered a valid question. The question is always, what am I supposed to do? And you always look to your family, your caste, the society to give you the answer to that question. 
And I never liked that. Um, so this book was perfect for me because it really raised, it is focused like a laser beam on just that issue. Do you authentically live? Do you authentically try to figure out the world, choose your path and go driven by yourself? Or do you get pushed by the society and just flow wherever the society wants you to go? So it's internal choice versus kind of society or what Ayn Rand calls first hand versus second hand. Um, and that was the issue for me. So, so I'm very grateful because that was exactly what I needed at that time. I also discovered, thanks to Ayn Rand, that there is this place called America where this is not unusual, where that is what people think you should be doing. I said, wow, I need to go there. So I, I, I basically, from then on, I just you know, made a beeline for America. It took me three years to get here but I was American spirit long before I got here. And um, so that is, that is my, you know, so Fontenay remains one of my favorite, all time favorite um, fiction books. Um, and um, I'm delighted uh, to be talking about it. So now I'm going to go to the panelists. So it's going to be Sherry, then Maritza, then Joya, and then Rob, and they can, uh, so Sherry, you have a floor. What would you like okay. to say about Fountainhead? Well, I love the way you put it, Shikant, um, because I grew up in a different, well, I, I guess many of my family members would have assumed I would have you know, followed in the regular path of what everybody else was doing, but it, it was not something I was willing to do at a very, a very young age, I had a great desire to become an architect. I thought it was weird that people would want to actually do other things. So <laughs> <laughs> it took me close to adulthood before I really understood that not everybody wanted to be an architect. Um, and it was many, many years, um, six, six or so years after I had made the conscious choice of this is what I wanted to do, that the, uh, the book, The Fountainhead was brought to my attention. I had no knowledge of it at all before. I was in architecture school. And of course, the background, for those of you who don't know, the background, the sort of the scenery of the book, if you will, is a, a specific moment in architectural history. Um, it draws from that, not, not directly, but um, in, um, in idea. It comes from a moment of architectural history when um, there is a, a break between the traditional, the way everything's always been done and a modern fresh uh, approach. Um, and I was uh, myself going through that same situation in a slightly different way. Um, I had been in uh, one architecture school um, and that wasn't uh, working well. Um, and I, I, I kept being asked by all the people around me over and over again in ways that made literally no sense to me. People would say to me, have you read The Fountainhead? And I hadn't, I didn't even know what it was. So after a while, I got kind of irritated by this question. <laughs> and I came to the point of having these responses like, oh, is that the book about the art? I don't have time to read this. And eventually having transferred to another architecture school and seeing essentially a different battle happening on this particular case, it was a architecture school that uh, focused on um, international style modern architecture, but had a group of uh, faculty coming in that was very much um, in the postmodern style. And there was this battle raging between these two camps, literally over the students' heads. 
students, teachers lit screaming at one another. This is how I went to architecture school. Um, anyway, so that background um, and was where I was introduced to the book. Um, in fact, by the man that introduced me to Rob. Yeah, um, mutual friend. <laughs> mutual friend. Um, so for me, during that battle that was happening and raging around me, um, the Fountainhead, in my mind, it was almost a user's manual. It was um, the way to answer how, what was going on around me and why. Um, and it was also, and this is tying into, you know, later on as we go into the Romantic Manifesto, uh, it was really fuel for me at a time that I really needed it. Um, it has remained a very important favorite book of fiction for me that I have read many, many times. Um, and it's quite interesting to me as I get older, um, I see different characters in a slightly different way. Thanks, Sherry. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is Marisa. Marisa, what would you like to say about The Fountainhead? Um, I also discovered The Fountainhead uh, as a teenager, late teens. I was, um, find, I found myself um, thrust into the very, very American world after having grown up a very sheltered life, very, in a very, very chaperoned culture where, you know, nothing was about the one. It was always about the group and it was always, you know, what would so-and-so think? Or one must always do things from the perspective of how is it gonna affect the others around you? And then, you know, now suddenly I'm, you know, 16, 17 and I'm, on my own, I have no parents. I'm now I have to speak English all the time. And just so many of the things that I had been taught, I'm learning that they just are not conducive to the world in which I'm, I'm, I'm currently walking. I read The Fountainhead and it was like, yes, there is somebody or someone or there was someone out there who felt this way. I have, some of you have heard me say this before and so I'm gonna repeat myself. That's okay, because it's a quote that's so worth repeating. To say I love you, one must first know how to say the I. This is a statement that's actually in the fountainhead and it is one that resonates with me and I can apply it to just about anything. You tell me you want coffee, I'll find a way to make this statement fit. It is a shining example of the central theme of the book where basically what, I mean, it's a, it is a fiction novel, but the author is expertly and delicately weaving together together a tale in such a manner that you almost don't realize that what she's actually giving you is an entire way of being that one can take and hold within themselves and you know ascribe to being and and what she's saying what i'm hearing as it were is that it's okay to be an individual. Not only is it okay, in fact, it's necessary. And that one is not somehow lesser for wanting that I. And that's so contrary to some things that I was taught as a child. And I, I see in today's society, we're ever increasingly more negative about people who do wish to uphold their own individuality. And it's funny because I can actually say that I find it sad that America is not, uh, has no sense of community. And then people look at me, well, how can you say that? And then this is your favorite statement. I don't find them to be contradictory because the sense of community only exists if every person within that community can acknowledge their own I. 
it's kind of like, you know, when they're telling you in the plane, you always hear them. If you have children, they say, you know, in the case of an emergency, make sure you affix the mask for yourself first and then tend to that of your child. Now, I personally don't have children, but I would imagine that mothers are like, oh, my baby has to come first. But if you stop and you consider the logic, the reasoning behind that is should you lose consciousness first? Well, now both of you are disabled. So it makes most sense for you to don your mask first and then you're in a position to help your children. And I believe that that's, this is perhaps a simpl simplification of it, but that's what I see the Ayn Rand telling us with this book. She's saying, find yourself. Like, you know, it, the, one of the main characters who is the antithesis of the hero of the story, he says to, one, to, to someone in the book, he says, you know, he's talking about somebody who he never sees alive. He never sees, they, they have zero life to them. He says, where is your eye? And her response to him is, where is yours? And nobody had ever asked him that before. And so that would be the question I would pose to all of you. If someone asks you, where is your eye? Do you know what you would say on the spot? right now. Thank you. Thanks, Marisa. That's great. Uh, Joya, you're next. Thank you. I'll start even by saying I love the quotes that, that Maritza shared. And I love the question you ask. And you make me realize that in my own personal development, reading Ayn Rand has helped me discover and define what has become so central to my I. I would not be the I that I am if I hadn't discovered Ayn Rand, that was when I was 13. And I actually read Atlas Shrugged first, but in many ways, I love The Fountainhead even more. I, precisely because of the character of Howard Rourke, who is the, the protagonist. And I had three stories and passages that I wanted to share that deeply resonated with me way back when I first read this at 13 and still continue to do so throughout my life. So I wanted to talk first about the idea of Howard Work as a creator and a first-hander. I want to talk about this idea of Howard Work as immortal. One of the characters, Steve Mallory, says that he's what the concept really means. And then I want to talk about the pain that only goes down to a certain point. And I think with these three ideas, we get a really profound sense of who Howard Work is and who Ayn Rand at her best really is. So first, the idea of Howard Work as a first-hander and a creator. This was something that just absolutely inspired me the first time I read this book and Atlas Shrugged, the way that all of these characters were so motivated by work that was so important. And I knew that that was something that I deeply wanted from my life. And of course, these characters are fiction, but Ayn Rand is real. So something that I've been very much interested in really even since I was 13, was about Ayn Rand as a creator. I wanted to know how did she come up with these ideas and write these books? And I was lucky enough, I, I had an opportunity to spend time at the Ayn Rand archives and go through some of her uh, bi biographical interviews. And she shares this wonderful story that I wanted to share with everyone about how she came up with the idea of Howard Work and Peter Keating, who's another one of the, the characters in the book. And, and she contrasts them as a first-hander versus a second-hander. So she tells this story. So, so if you don't know anything about Ayn Rand, it's important to know she um, was born in, in Russia and lived through the Soviet dictatorship. She was lucky enough to escape in the mid-20s, came to the US, and first was working some odd jobs in Hollywood. And while she was there, she met this girl, Marcella. And I, I love this story because it's a great story about uh, system one and system two, although Ayn Rand didn't call it that, she would have called it the subconscious and conscious, but that's really what the story is all about. So she tells a story that when she met Marcella, Marcella was ambitious and career oriented, hardworking in a time when many women didn't even have careers at all. And Ayn Rand, her system two, she knew she liked all of these things about Marcella. But at the same time, her system one, she knew her subconscious that she was thoroughly opposed and disliked Marcella in a very deep way, but she could not define or articulate why. And she was thinking about it. She, she couldn't put her finger on it. So one day she, she just goes up and asks Marcella outright. She says, you know, I see that you're working really hard, but 
what is this for? What is the goal in life that you are pursuing? What are you after? And Marcella says, this is what I want. If nobody had an automobile, I wouldn't want an automobile. But if automobiles exist and some people have them, then I want an automobile. And if some people have two automobiles, then I want two automobiles. And Ayn Rand said she heard this and it was a light bulb, a revelation. And she immediately saw comparing Ayn Rand to Marcella, she grasped the essence of Howard Rourke versus Peter Keating. Because Howard Rourke is like Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand knew that if she was ambitious, it was because she had ideals, convictions. She had this ambition to present her view of man as a heroic being. And she had philosophical principles about individualism that she wanted to express. And then contrast that with Marcella, who essentially just wants to keep up with the Joneses. And so in that, we see how Ayn Rand even came up with this great insight about the first-hander versus the second-hander and the importance of being a creator and living a creator's life. And that's something that I have strived to do my life ever since this book. So that's definitely the first point I wanted to talk about and the one that I think really gets to the core of who Ayn Rand is. Then I wanted to share another passage that I think is really profound, a deep truth that Ayn Rand expresses through this idea of who Howard Work is. So at one point in the book, she has uh, one of the secondary characters, Steve Mallory, describe Howard Work. He says, I often think that he's the only one of us who's achieved immortality. I don't mean in the sense of fame, and I don't mean that he won't die someday, but he's living it. I think he is what the conception really means. You know how people long to be eternal, but they die with every day that passes. When you meet them, they're not what you met last. In any given hour, they kill some part of themselves. They change, they deny, they contradict, and they call it growth. At the end, there's nothing left, nothing unreversed or unbetrayed. As if there had never been an entity, only a succession of adjectives fading in and out on an unformed mass. How do they expect a permanence which they have never held for a single moment? But Howard, one can imagine him existing forever. And I absolutely love this passage because the way I see it, for human beings to flourish, we need both to change and to stay the same. And so there's a, a superficial bad way, you could say, in which people change and stay the same. But there's also a profound good way that people change and stay the same. So to be clear, the way I see it, the, the superficial bad way that people change is that they don't have convictions or principles. They just follow the latest trend. They fall into a job or new group of friends, and they completely change who they are. As Marissa said, they don't know who their eye is. That eye is continually changing. That's, that's the bad superficial way people change. And there's a bad superficial way that people stay the same, mostly, I think, through laziness and stagnation. They don't actually have ambition to try to improve themselves or grow. But then there are the profound deep ways that I believe people ought to change and people ought to stay the same. In terms of changing, I think it is about learning and personal growth and development. And I know in this wonderful group that Srikan has put together, I know there are some experts here who are experts in education and I do coaching. And I know a lot of people here, I think even what unites I see in this group are people who very much believe in this idea of ambition toward continuous growth. But I believe it is a both and. You want the continuous growth and you want to stay the same in this profound way that Iron recognizes of having principles, having convictions, having an eye that lasts. And to my mind, Ayn Rand is one of the few people who really grasps this and, and talks about it. I, I think we don't really even have a good word in English for this idea of the good way to stay the same. So I think that's one of the really profound things that we can learn from her. And, and I'm sure my time is almost up. I also wanted to talk about this other quote from the book where the character Howard Rourke, he builds this wonderful temple, but it is destroyed by his enemies. But he has this point that 
the pain only goes down to a certain point. And I would even love to hear from everyone here about that quote, if that's something that you've experienced or, or witnessed other people experiencing. I'll just start by saying that that quote really struck me the first time I read the book because it, it completely corresponded to something I had observed. I, I had a great aunt whom I love very dearly. She was part of my Italian side of the family and like many Italians, very vibrant and full of life. Unfortunately, her, her husband, my great uncle, passed away very suddenly. It was very shocking. He had a heart attack in the middle of the night one night. But my great aunt had this phrase that during the funeral, even during this incredibly sad, awful event, she just kept saying, we dance through life. And this happened when I was 10 years old. And, and I remember thinking then that that was who I wanted to be when I grew up, someone who could look at the darkest, bleakest moments of life and still see the joy and the positive. So that would even be the question I would wanna ask is, is, do you have this experience of the pain that only goes down to a certain point? Excellent, Joya. That's that's great. Um, Rob? Oh, I'm now yeah. unmuted. Okay. <laughs> this is the, you know, the, the year in which everybody learns how to use the mute button. Uh, okay. So one thing that strikes me is that a number of these people, a number of people who've commented so far came, you, Srikanth, and, and Maritza, came from cultures where sort of traditionalism and conformity tradition was, was very important. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in America where individualism, you know, in this, it was the 70s, you know, free to be you and me. Uh, the uh, individualism was considered a value. And one of the things that strikes me about the Fountainhead, though, is how much substance it adds to the concept of individualism. The individualism in America can often be sort of fall into a superficial form where it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's sort of the hippie individualism of, uh, acting on your feelings, sort of doing things randomly. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think that uh, in that context, the, the Fountainhead's message, I think, is so timely to the modern world. Because you know, um, we see a lot of the, uh, there was a thing that came out, it happened a couple of years ago, where uh, Kim Kardashian comes out with this book called Selfish. And it's a, just a collection of her selfies that she's posted online. And, you know, this was sort of, of course, looked upon as, well, of course, she's selfish. Of course, this is, you know, I, I'm thinking, what evidence is there of a self there? She's, she's really just thinks of herself, her whole existence is a reflection in the eyes of other people. And that's very much the Peter Keating sort of character, uh, you know, one of the major characters of the Fountainhead, who is uh, based on the, the one that she based on this Marcella that, that Joya talked about, uh, where, you know, he, he wants to be whatever other people want him to be. And his whole existence is a reflection in the eyes of others. Okay, uh, Rob. Yeah. Okay, you froze for a second. Go ahead. Reflection oh, okay. in the eyes of others. Continue. Yeah. So he he doesn't. He wants if he wants to make them was it there's a I think there's a line that that she has a description but he doesn't oh Howard Rook describing uh, uh, Peter Keating says. He doesn't want to be a great architect. He wants to be thought great. And uh, or at the very at the very beginning of the uh, of the story, he's just you know graduated top of his class from architecture school, and he's talking, looking at his bright future. He's going to, I'm going to, he's going to go on and do really great things in 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 oh yeah in architecture. You know, and it, it doesn't matter the field. He said doesn't matter. What matters is that he's going to be thought well of in the eyes of others. And so it's a sort of. Uh, false ambitiousness or false individualism in a way of I'm going to aggrandize myself but without going through the trouble of creating a self that's underneath that. Uh, and I think that's an interesting, uh, so that, that makes it a very timely in, in today's context and in the context of the sort of individualism that's in American culture. You know, I often think, um, you know, if, if you were, so in the Fountainhead, there's this very specific context for it. Sherry talked a little bit about the context of the history of architecture, that there was you know, the historical styles versus innovative modernism. But the other context is it was it's set in the red decade, uh, basically in the 1930s when uh, collectivism and communism and Marxism and, and you know, these collect openly collectivist ideologies were sort of the fashion among the intellectual set at the time. So there's this sort of confluence in, in Peter Keating that 
on the one hand, he is a conformist, but he's also someone who is in an environment, or at least among the elite intellectuals with which in the circle he circles he moves in, where collectivism is also considered an ideal. So you know, and Ellsworth Tui is the character who represents that collectivist intellectual who sells people on the ideal of conformity, the ideal of merging into the group. But what strikes me is that in a lot of a lot of times in America, the individualism is so considered is considered to be a good thing in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, if you think about it, if if you had a Peter Keating who came along in a culture where Howard Rourke is the ideal, what would he try to do? Well, he'd try to look like Howard Rourke and sound like Howard Rourke and you know, be Howard Rourke as much as he could, but it would all be superficial. It would all be he'd have the image, you know, he wouldn't want to be Howard Rourke. He'd want to be seen to be Howard Rourke. And I think you get a lot of that in, in American culture where you have that sort of the individual's about substance or as Ayn Rand put it later, selfishness without a self. Um, and I, but the timeliness of that to today, I think is interesting because um, you hear a lot of things today about, uh, you know, about the selfie culture of the Kim Kardashian types or about um, on the other side, you're talking about conformity, that there's, a lot of concern right now about cancel culture, what they call cancel culture, which is you know, these Twitter mobs, these online mobs that form and try to drive out and, and eliminate anybody who has a non-conforming viewpoint. And sometimes that's blamed on, oh, it's the problem with social media, it's the problem with Facebook or Twitter, and it's a, it's a product of the internet age. Well, all of it is right there in the fountainhead, you know, which was written in, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, uh, set in the 20s and 30s. So all of this happened way before the internet. It's a, a universal sort of human dilemma. And uh, it, it, and the interesting thing is that it, it's, uh, so it happened outside of the context of any particular technology, all this stuff was going on, you know, and the worst Twitter, Twitter troll you could find couldn't teach Gail Wynand anything about how to smear people and how to use dishonest arguments and how to you know try to whip up the mob against against someone. So this is all universal and it's been there before, and uh, it, it's so, that must make it so relevant to the, to our time is this idea that uh, um, you know, you talked about in the after the election having this thing of how can we act in a civil way towards each other? How can we overcome the resentments of the election? And uh, what strikes me is that, you know, the, too much of the discussion these days is about one group versus another. And uh, are, you, uh, are you following the, the, the Trump line or are you following the Democratic Party line, et cetera? And the refreshing thing about the Fountainhead, I think in contrast to some extent with, uh, with Atlas Shrugged is how non-political the focus of the novel is. You know, it's about artists and intellectuals and it's about the work they're doing as artists and intellectuals. And it reminds me of a line, uh, so, so Ayn Rand said something about it. She said, uh, the novel is about individuals versus collectivism, not in politics, but in men's souls. Mm -hmm. And that reminded me of a line from, uh, from Solzhenitsyn, the, the uh, Russian uh, Soviet dissident, who said, you know, the, the, the line between good and evil doesn't go between parties. It goes to the center of every man's soul. And your decisions about what you make and what you're going to do, that that make the difference in your life and that are the decisions of the, the choices of good or evil are not political. They have to do with your personal aspect of how you're going to shape your soul. And that's what I like about the focus of the Fountainhead, especially as, you know, as an interesting contrast to Atlas Drugged is that focus is very much on what are you putting into yourself? That is what, you know, how do you, how do you, it's not about if before you can express yourself, you have to fill yourself with something. So, uh, and in order to be an individualist, you have to have something in your individual soul that is there to express. And it's, it's very much focusing, uh, encouraging us to focus inward on what am I putting into my soul? And is it something that I'm simply deriving from others or from habit or from doing unthinkingly? Or is it something that I have done firsthand? And that's the last thing I want to talk about is that, that we, I think really ties that all together, which is that concept of firsthand versus secondhand. And that's the, the, the phrase that she introduces in the novel uh, of describing a firsthander versus a secondhander. And actually her original working title for the novel was Secondhand Lives. And it was this idea that you know the, 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 the people like the, the Marcella, the, the, the inspiration for Peter Keating, 
she recognized that when you ask them what they want, everything was coming secondhand. It was borrowed from others. And if there weren't others around there to want things and do things, they would have no idea what to do. As opposed to someone whose desires and interests and values are firsthand, uh, that are derived directly from their encounter, their own individual encounter with the world and with reality and are derived from their own, uh, uh, their own work at understanding the world and deciding what they want to do with it. And I think that's the, so they, that's the interesting thing is that the way she has in, in the Fountainhead, she's not just praising individualism, she's also defining individualism or in some ways redefining individualism by defining it as having those firsthand values from a direct confrontation with reality rather than taking your values and goals and interests and having them be derived by, by either by trying to get yourself reflected in others or having others reflected in yourself. You know, not do it, doing it directly firsthand from yourself or deriving everything from others. I think that's the really profound issue in the Fountainhead. Excellent, uh, folks. Um, so this is a great way of you know, putting things on the table. Now, everybody gets to ask one question of the panel. I think Joya has already put her question on the table. So let's start with that. And then everybody else also will have opportunity of, um, of putting a question on the table. So Joya, would you like to state, restate your question and then others can choose to answer it? Sure, so mine was uh, based on a quote in this book, uh, of an experience of pain that only goes down to a certain point. And I'm just curious if anybody else has any personal stories of experiencing that or, or witnessing it like I did with my aunt. So Marisa, Sherry, Rob, would you like to uh, add anything? Uh, Go ahead. Throw in that is that uh, that actually comes in, in Howard Rourke's, uh, in, the, in the novel with Howard Rourke, it comes in a professional context. And boy, I've had to deal with that once or twice. Um, you know, in my work as a writer, uh, you know, I do a lot of different things and, and oftentimes typically I'm, uh, one of the, some of these ventures, I'm the content guy and somebody else is the money guy. And I've had a number of times where, you know, it happens that the money guy runs out of money. And so this thing I've been pouring my work and, and, and effort into uh, for a couple of years, you know, suddenly it's like it goes poof and it goes away and you have to start over again. And it can be a rough thing to do. Uh, but again, it's the, 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 the pain that only goes down to a certain point. It's like, all right, you know, that, that, and I think it has to do with being motivated by the work itself. So you look at it and say, well, fine. You know, I liked this website that I was working on. I thought it was great. Uh, but the website is just the vehicle. And the, the fundamental thing is what is the work that I want to do as I'll go find another way to do it. And I think that's part of that's part of the pain that goes on to a certain point is that you have that core of a value, a thing you want to do in the world that gives your life meaning. And so you can handle the loss of other things uh, because that core remains. Excellent. Um, so who would like to put the next question on the table? Sherry, Rob, or Marissa? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I was getting ready to answer that question. So oh, you, okay, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, answer the question. Uh, everybody gets to answer the question if they want. Go ahead. No, no, um, that is a, and, and like the other, this is a book, as, as you, many of you probably have been able to uh, tell so far, it's a deeply personal book for me. Um, and and it's and it's partially because it's a, a oddly similar background, um, but so the the issue the the description that Joy is talking about the Howard Rourke scene about the idea of pain going down so far, that always reminds me of the scene where on his last penny, uh, Howard Rourke is presenting. Uh, uh, designs and has to deal with um, a, a whole group of investors who are not so sure about his ideas and his designs. Um, and even at that point of um, 
poverty, um, that issue of his design having to need for his own purposes, for his own soul, having to need to keep that true to himself. Um, that's where I think, the, and then having it rejected, of course, because um, otherwise the book would be over. <laughs> um, so I, I think that point um, is, it, it explains that in such a, a beautiful way. And honestly, um, that gets back to Rob's point about the universality of it. Um, it doesn't matter what field you're in. I'm sure all of us have some sort of situation in our lives where we've had that kind of a, uh, a dilemma that we had to make that choice. And the pain that comes from that, um, it, 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 whether or not you allow it to go down to a certain point or all the way down, one will undo you, the other won't. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Marisa? Um, that was so well stated. Um, I'm almost scared to go after that. But I, I it also is a good segue. The, so Joy asked a question and that scenery that she, the scene she described, I find that it goes in tandem with another aspect that we're asked to investigate within ourselves in the book. And that's the question of fear. And, you know, in that scene that uh, Sherry just described, you know, he's down to his very, very last um, dollars here. And he actually walks away from a deal because they want him to compromise his design and he refuses to do so. And he, the theme throughout the entirety of the book the hero of the novel, Howard Work, he is required to walk away from so many different types of things that upon inspection, they're just scenarios that are shining a spotlight on the human condition, which is fear, right? And, and you know, he he's, he and uh, Dominique Francon, they have like this like huge love, but she, her life within the story as narrated is one of fear for allowing herself to feel because she's an all or nothing type of person. And she acknowledges, she fears that love. She fears it, it will, it, not that it will destroy her, but she feel, fears how, the thing or the person, the object that she loves will be treated by the world in general. And, you know, Howard Wark tells her, you must learn not to be afraid of the world, not to be held by it as you are now. Um, so I guess my question would be, how do some of you, how do you guys view that? Do you think that it's a, an, a, it's a fear of, an internal fear or an external fear? How would, I mean, I would view it as an internal question that she has to come to grips on her own, but I'm just interested in how others might view it. So, Joya, Sherry, you Rob? I, sure. I can go oh, No, you can go ahead, Rob. Okay, um, well, one of the things I find interesting, so I'm, I'm working on a series, I did a series of article, articles a while back uh, on the issue of sense of life. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really interested in, in doing a series on um, on the Romantic Manifesto, because it's where Ayn Rand talks about this concept of sense of life, you know, your sort of subconscious estimate of the world and the state of the world and your, your place in the world. And one of the points I made there, because um, I think it's, it's one that people really must understand, is that a sense of life isn't a like an estimate of the current state of things. How are things going at this moment, right? It's because it's you, you could, things could be better or worse. You know, but maybe your candidate just won the election, your candidate just lost the election. Uh, you just lost a job. You just got a job. You know, the, your, your, your conditions can change, but that's not the same thing as sense of life. 
sense of life isn't about your external conditions. It's about your view of yourself and of the world in general. And I think that that connects to this idea of the fear because when Howard Rourke uh, makes his decision to you know, walk away from a project, he's his concern and his, he, let's put it this way, the, the outcome he fears more is that he would go living with this compromised values, this mm -hmm. compromised vision. They would destroy the internal vision that's motivating him. And the fear of, okay, I'm going to have no money and I'm not going to be able to pay the electric bill. That is, you know, a tiny fear compared to the fear of losing himself. Whereas for Dominique Franken, you know, she's not a second hander, but her fear of what will happen to the things I love out in the world, or what, how, how will the world affect them? Mm -hmm. it, it becomes overwhelming to the, you know, and, to, and prevents her from acting and for, from being able to, to outwardly live her, uh, 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 well, uh, live according, uh, outwardly pursue the values that she would like to pursue. Uh, and then for Peter Keating, of course, you know, what will other people think is the primary thing. He's totally overwhelmed by fear of what will other people think about me and and you know uh, there's a scene very early on I like to stick to examples early on so people who haven't read the book they only get you know stuff from the first oh no spoilers God, yeah not too many spoilers. No spoilers but there's a scene early on where he's uh, deciding between two courses of action and uh one of them is that you know well if you if you which you know he's, he's gonna take a job at one place or a, a scholarship somewhere else and then somebody mm -hmm. says, well, if you let the, you know, if you don't take this job that's been offered, then Schlinker, his rival at the school, Schlinker will get the job and everybody will think he's the better man. It's like, oh no, not Schlinker. <laughs> People couldn't possibly think I, that Schlinker that, yeah, that, that, that uh, is better than me. So I better take this job. His whole future direction of his career is built around the fear of what other people will think. And, you know, whereas the actual thing of what do I want to do with my life? What is the, what are the values I want to pursue? The fear of losing that, he, you know, he has an under, he doesn't have the fear of losing that. And that's what sort of leads him in the direction he goes. Uh, so, you know, Sherry and I had discussion many, many years ago, and you'll remember this, uh, that she was, you know, upset that in some context, somebody who, uh, uh, who didn't deserve something like a promotion or a job or something. They had gotten that job and they gotten it into sort of dishonest, you know, by, uh, by having to uh, go along to get along and, and know you know, go into the office politics and all that sort of thing. And they had gotten this thing that she hadn't gotten. And I said, well, the thing to remember is their punishment is having to be who they are, right? So your punishment, <laughs> if you, you know, are rising up in the way Peter Keating does, and this is what's shown in the novel, the punishment for Peter Keating for sort of dishonestly manipulating and climbing, clawing his way to the top in this second-handed way, his punishment is having to be that person. It's having to give up the every aspect of his own internal soul and his internal vision in order to not have and, and give it up in order to feed uh, or to to protect himself from this fear of what other people will think. And that's you know it's a terrible way to live. He's basically living in fear. So I think that's why putting it in terms of fear is a great way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Joya? I was just going to say that I, I like Maritza's question. The way that I see this character, Dominique, she has this fear that is both of the world and, and in, internal inside herself as well. She has the fear that the world is going to destroy work and work is her ideal. So what would that mean for her? And again, I don't really want to spoil the book, but I think even what we see in, in this one passage with the quote about the pain that go, only goes down to a certain point. What I take from that is that we see that when, when someone like a Howard work creates a magnificent building, or if it's Rob writing a great article or my aunt building a good marriage, that when you achieve these things, there is a way in which the way I almost like to envision it, I feel it's almost like you have sort of a, I see it like a golden core inside you that then nothing can destroy. People can die, people can ruin your buildings, people can take away your funding, but you have this golden core of what it is that you've achieved that makes you unconquerable in that sense, that gives you a kind of happiness that can't be destroyed. And I think that's even a huge part of what Dominique has to learn throughout the book. 
And, and that, Joya, goes right back to your Mallory quote from earlier about mm. that being the thing that makes Rourke immortal. It's that almost purity of soul, that happiness, that's uh, profound happiness. All right. Uh, Sherry or Rob, would you like to put a question on the table? I have an somewhat interesting, maybe possibly interesting question that I wouldn't ask people, which is, you know, oftentimes you read a novel, you identify with one character or another, that somebody seems more like, that's me, than the character mm -hmm. in the novel. That's, that's the person I, the person I understand the most internally. Uh, so I, the question I had is, who do you identify most with in The Fountainhead? Okay, wonderful. So what we'll do is that on, uh, let's, uh, so if anybody wants to answer it, they can do that. But uh, folks, people who are listening, take all these questions into the breakout room. So initially, I'm, I want to get these people, these panelists, a chance to talk about their takes on it. And you can do the same in the breakout rooms, okay? Um, so does uh, Joya or uh, Maritza or Sherry want to answer? I, I have to say that I don't believe that any one character would be me per se, but I see bits of myself in a few of the characters. Yep. Sometimes even when it's a, oh, maybe I should watch doing that. <laughs> um, from, you know, the Dominique speaks to me because I empathize with the penchant for not wanting to allow the world to take anything I hold dear from me. And in acknowledging that that's kind of an unhealthy way to be and I need to work on it. I, you know, Howard Work is, you know, he's, he's the hero and everybody loves the hero. And his are the principles, the values that just speak to me. Like, you know, I have used his character often in trying to explain a value I hold to other people in my life. But um, I don't, I would not presume to think of myself as a, um, Howard Rourke, uh, you know, the human condition is in general not so consistent as the beauty of a fictional ideal <laughs> character, unfortunately. But um, I do find that the, the un, the, the, the Dominique transforms the most in the book and that really does sing to me because every time I read the book, it, her tale and the way it ends just makes me feel light. It all, I'm always left feeling that if she can find her way, then there's hope for me. I have so many more issues to work on, but if she can, and she can overcome these like vast fears, then that there's hope for me. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, what I'm going to do is that I want to make uh, my comments about Fountainhead, and then we will go to uh, Q&A from the audience. I'm sure audience is going to have amazing questions. So um, folks, you can go ahead and line up for questions. I'm going to give priority to people who have typed exclamation marks first. Um, so you can go ahead and type exclamation mark. Um, you know, as I said, you know, growing up for me, this core issue was stunning. But then I've read it, read this book multiple times. And what happens is that as you read a great work of art, you understand more and more things. And one of the things that was really stunning for me is the structure of it. You know, it has, and because what happens is that the way a good story, you just run through the story, you know, you, you just run through the story. But then after you've read it multiple times, you can see how, how beautiful it is put together. It has four sections, okay? It starts with Peter Keating. First one is called Peter Keating. Second is Ellsworth Tuhi. 
third one is Gail Winan, and fourth one is Howard Rock. Okay, these are the four choices because she's talking about the theme between first-hander and second-hander, right? So the first one, so, so that's, that's one thing. So these are the four characters that talk about four fundamental choices you can make. Um, also, I like the sequence very much. Um, to me, it's kind of like Beethoven's Fifth Symphony in four movements, okay? The first symphony states the theme. Ba, 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 pam. Like, it, it's a very bold statement. You know, Howard Rock laughs. Uh, and it's contrast with Peter Keating. That's the first section, okay? So that just sets off what are we trying to do. The second section is elsewhere to him. I mean, that is pure evil. Somebody who understands the first standard, understands the second standard, knows how, it, how everything works and how to use it. Okay, so that's like the, the deepest things, the second movement where there is, it's kind of, you know, this will that was started out in the first movement of Beethoven. The second one is kind of say, okay, this is the pain you have to go through. This is what you have to deal with. Gail Wynan is kind of coming out of that. That's the third movement. It's kind of, it try, tries to rise. If you look at the fifth symphony, it tries to rise, but then it falls again. It tries to rise and falls again. Gail Wynan is somebody who has, who is firsthand in his means, but accepts the ends secondhand. So no matter how great he does in terms of actuating his means, ultimately it is going, it is becoming secondhand. So it keeps failing. Okay. And then finally it is Howard Rock, the fourth movement, the triumph, triumph, where Howard Rock, you know, the book is kind of at the end, as at the top of the tallest skyscraper that he himself has built with Dominic coming up to towards him. So that's like, it's, it's a structure, almost a symphonic structure uh, by clearly identifying what are the possibilities on this first hand and second hand and what are the different choices you make and how do these interact with one another. Um, and so that, that's, that's what I love about it. All right, so now we are going to go to audience questions. Uh, give me just a second, I'm going to let questions. Okay, it's going to be Mary, uh, Mike and Kevin. So folks, keep your questions. Again, we have four rules. Type exclamation mark to ask questions or raise your hand in Zoom. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, feel free to disagree with anybody on anything, but do so courteously. Currently, we are not taking any opinions, just questions. So it's going to be Mary, Mike, Kevin, and Brian. Mary, go ahead. My question is, how do you reconcile her love of reason with the consequences. So in her, her, her faith and reason has, I believe, undermined her. And I love the Fountainhead. I think it's beautiful that she, that, you know, it's all about following an ideal that you believe in. But following that faith and reason led her in Atlas Shrugged later to characters that didn't, were almost caricatures and did not give emotion. And even in her own personal erotic life led her to rationalize an affair with somebody 25 years younger. She was married, he was younger. Uh, what's what's your question? What's your question? How do you rationalize her faith and reason, which is the underlying theme in Fountainhead to Got it. her evolution in life and her later novels? Okay, uh, who would like to answer? Oh. <laughs> if I may just, sure. so I, I have fielded this question before and my answer is that we are human beings first at our very core, emotional creatures. We are not the perfection of a written fictional character. She is just like you and I valuable. So her life story is not going to read as perfectly as a novel will. Um, I don't believe it is a rationalization that is required when consider considering her philosophical ideas and comparing them to her life. One can see where she deviated, obviously, but I believe that's separate and tangential to the question of 
is it a worthy philosophical thought experiment to consider reason as a valid ideal to ascribe to? And that's really what the book is asking us to do, to view reasoning and thinking with a really high value quotient. Uh, Sherry or Rob, would you like to add anything? Well, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't mention, I, I'm not going to comment on Ayn Rand's personal life because, you know, I don't know that much about it. So it's not like I can judge, you know, what whether what she did was rational or not. But uh, what I will say about, I, I want to challenge the idea that I think the, the, the idea that the characters in Atlas Shrugged are not as realistic, they're not, they're not fleshed out. I've heard that before, but I, I think that you have to give it a, a I, I disagree with it because I find you know, there's, there's a lot of emotional, I never just wrote a whole book about Atlas Shrugged. So there's a lot of emotional depth to the characters. You know, the whole theme of like part one of, of Atlas Shrugged, the whole theme is actually about the emotional vulnerability of the main characters. That uh, the, their sense of loneliness in a world that's collapsing and doesn't seem to value what, they, what they're doing. And you know, there's several scenes with, with Dagny Taggart that are very much focused on that. So you know, Ayn Rand was believed in high drama in her literature. We're going to see that in, in, the, uh, in the Romantic Manifesto. She believed in high drama. She was, she was you know, sort of basically, she, literarily, she was an opera lover, right? Because you know, <laughs> if, you, if you go to, you know, if, you're, if you're a fan of the opera, as I am, you know that it's always about the highest possible drama. How can you stir the emotions? the fullest extent and that was very much what she valued so she's always trying to put her characters in these very extreme situations where you know uh you know you're about to get a in the fountainhead you're about to get this commission that would make your career as an architect but they want you to put neoclassical columns that go against all your principles and if you don't take it you're going to be penniless and you know bankrupt and basically have to start over from nothing she loved to do that. She put, the, put her characters. That's something she got from Victor Hugo, by the way. Uh, you know, who, who always loved this idea of let's let's you know Jean Valjean. Let's make let's make every decision and every possible part of his life make it as difficult as possible. Put him through as many different obstacles to make him do. You know, he has to do the right thing by going over as many different obstacles as possible. And she she loved to do that. And she she kept doing it in the in in, in Atlas Shrugged. I think that. Maybe if it's some, maybe this is something that for some reason when you read it didn't connect with you, but I think if you go looking for it, uh, it's, it's definitely there. Uh, but I also I'd also say the thing of uh, being rational, uh, you know, let's say you know if you you grant the premise that maybe you don't like what the characters in one of her novels does, or that you don't like what she did in her personal life, I'd also say that being rational is not the same thing as being infallible, right? So you can be you know using reason is a method and it's the best method for finding what is the right thing to do or the best thing to do for, for achieving your values and achieving your goals and for deciding what your values and goals are. It's better than any other thing that you have, which is just flying blind, but it doesn't guarantee you're not going to make mistakes or you're not going to, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and being dedicated to using reason, it's something I see a lot, being dedicated to using reason doesn't mean you're successfully going to do it. You can you, you always have the danger. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's been a, a vogue recently of talking about cognitive bias. Uh, and I think there's a lot to that, that you know, identifying all these different cognitive biases people have that will tend to draw them, you know, take them off the rails and, and cause them to not make the rational decision, but be lured away by some appearance of rationality or some, you know, one of them is, for example, uh, they call it the availability heuristic that you're, you're misled by what is, what is the most available fact? What is the fact that has most recently come to your attention influences you as opposed to taking a dispassionate look and putting it, balancing it with all the facts that you have available. Um, and one of the themes of that is how difficult it is to be to overcome these uh, cognitive biases uh, uh, and uh, you know, how, how, um, deceptive and how tempting they can often be so that being rational is a lot of work and you have to there's a lot of different ways you can go wrong it doesn't mean it's not a good idea it means and 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 so it means that it is the best way of doing things or at least you know the um the case for it is, is the best way of doing things as opposed to all the other alternatives which are 
flying blind and you know going into error in a very predictable way as opposed to you know trying your best to avoid the errors by thinking about what you're doing uh thanks rob uh next up is going to be mike kevin brian and joe mike what's your question i'm looking for you to say something about uh the relevance of individualism versus collectivism from Ayn Rand's mid 20th century life uh, versus uh, what we face now with uh, uh, the, the migration into artificial intelligence and the work situation, uh, the meaning of work and the meaning of social engineering of today. Uh, Wesley Mooch and um, uh, and Ellsworth Tui are, were social architects who are demonized as immoral. And uh, Rourke uh, and uh, John Galt uh, are, demon, demon, are uh, elevated as being totally moral. And uh, uh, I, to some extent, uh, I view that as uh, Hayek uh, versus Keynes as, uh, as the issue. And, right. But is that, how much of that fits today's situation where we're about to enter uh, another transition? Uh, okay. That... Mike, uh, end with a question, please. <laughs> uh, okay. The question is buried in there. How do you view the, uh, the that, uh, how does it that apply panel now? of morality as to today's world? Got it. Got it. Uh, who would like to take it? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure where artificial intelligence comes into it. So I want to just mention that you know, because one of the I mentioned earlier that you know I've done a number of projects where I'm I'm the content guy and someone's the money guy. One of those was a site called Real Clear Future, where uh, one of the things I dealt with was emerging technologies and artificial intelligence and that sort of thing. And and one of the things that struck me is how little changes with the change of technology. <laughs> you know, the, the, it, there are some substantial things that can happen. Like, you know, you view people's, I think the most radical thing to happen uh, uh, in terms of changing the experience of human life is the uh, development of antibiotics and the huge, which, which tied into a bunch of other things to create a huge increase in lifespan. And you take, you approach your life differently when you can expect to live seven, over 70 years old. Rob, let me, let me, let me interrupt. I came up with a way of phrasing his question, uh, Mike's question. So he's, he's asking, given that the technology has changed dramatically since Ayn Rand wrote this, um, in this kind of connected world, how does the issue of individualism versus collectivism play out today versus then? Is there any difference? Yeah. So, well, as so I was saying, there, I think there are some cases you can make for technological advances that really change the way life works and is experienced. But this is one where, I, you know, like I said, the, that everything about, I think I said earlier, everything about the, the selfie culture of today, the social media conformity and all of that, it's all the same as it was in the fountainhead. You can see it. It's just, it's happening through a different medium. It's, it's uh, you know, a yellow journals in, in the fountainhead, uh, the mechanism of conformity is yellow journals and newspapers. And today it's websites and social media. Uh, so I think the fundamentals don't really change. And you know, we mentioned artificial intelligence. One of the things that I was impressed with is how how little there is to how much to the idea that all these things are going to fundamentally change change the world when you examine what they really do. I mean, artificial intelligence will, or, or, or you know the connectedness of the world, the internet. It's people doing the same things, all the same things through a different medium. That, that, that's that's a great point. I, the way I see it is that it's just more off. Like for example, Facebook will just kind of it's the same kind of motivations as before that used to operate in a smaller group. It's just operating in a larger group, and both for positive and negative. I think it, it applies. It's just kind of increases the scale, increases the speed, those kind of things. But otherwise, I think the fundamentals remain the same. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin, Brian, and Joe. Kevin. Yes, thank you, Frank. Uh, just follow Mike. I would say it's uh, a new reality powered by AI. Even uh, smaller group. Uh, folks, yeah. let's keep the question yeah. short, okay? Okay. My question is about the individual from the fountain head. More specific, was it individualism culture changed uh, from your your opinion in this 20th century? 
Thank you. Srikant, can you repeat that question? Uh, so the question is, uh, has the culture of uh, individualism changed? How has it changed over time? The, the core idea. I mean, the, uh, I, I, will, I, I will answer that. I don't think individualism has changed. You know, individual is what an individual is. And I think what technology is, is that it just enables us to do more. And it, it just increases the scale. It increases the, you know, the way in which we interact with one another. But at the core, I don't think individuals has changed at all. And the, so this issue is, um, it, I think it remains, it remains the same. Uh, can I add something? Why I ask, ask this question? I would say our culture used to be uh, limited, let's say, during the you know communication. Now it's like culture uh, interact each other. It's more flat. Okay, let, let, me so, let, let, yeah. let me let me deal with that. So there is a lot of uh, so what you're saying is that culture interacts with one another, and actually it's kind of it, I mean, for me uh, the way I see it is that it's actually a way of reducing the boundaries. So if you look at a tribe of people and you're completely surrounded by the tribe and you have no contact with anybody else, the extent to which the tribe controls what you can do and determines that, and it's much more tribal. Um, I think what technology does, what people moving between areas, connecting with each other across, uh, across space, uh, what all of that does is that it reduces that tribalness, and it I think allows individuals to be more so. So I think I think in you know I think it's a tremendous thing for individual. I think it's a wonderful time to be to be a, you know to be an individual living today. You know I'm always thankful for it. Does anybody else want to add anything? I have something I'd like to say if I can jump in. Yes. I might actually slightly disagree with Rob because the way I see it, the way technology is accelerating, I think we could see a very big shift. We're about to get computing power that might make it possible for us to actually model a, a human brain. And then when we do that, we could connect brains together in a way that would be unlike anything we've ever seen before and, and could be a big sea change in, in what it is to be connected. But I would argue that then it will be more important than ever to understand who we are as individuals. Because to bring it back to something that Maritza mentioned at the very beginning, we are individuals in communities. So the more we become connected and, and uh, more of a, a community, the more important it will be for us to understand exactly what it is to be an individual. Okay, next up is uh, Brian, Joe, and Jyoti. Brian, what's your question? Um, my question is in regards to uh, defining individualism and understanding the I, um, does the author give any hints as to uh, what defines a person the most? Absolutely. Um, it's our reason in mind. So, you know, Ayn Rand tells us that everything we are and everything we come from comes from a single attribute of man. And it, it is that of their reason in mind. Um, she states that um, subtly throughout the entirety of the book and she states it explicitly in the final trial um, that Howard, Work, Howard Rourke finds himself in at the very, um, well, not the very end, but very close to the end of the novel. He actually states that, you know, and he says, um, um, you know, he says the reason in mind cannot work under any form of compulsion. And so as such, you know, they're shining a spotlight on that. That is, you know, that's individualism there. That's the ideal, you know, a collect, the brain is there. I mean, I know Joya just said that we're moving towards a potentiality for collective brain, but Ayn Rand tells us that there is no such thing as a collective brain, not naturally within ourselves. And because there is no such thing as a collective brain, we are reminded that we are individuals. Does that answer your question? Let, let me throw another in there. Um, when you read the book, and Srikant mentioned this in the four parts of the book, four different approaches to either one side of individualism or completely the opposite. 
Um, when you read the book, also pay attention that she is using the descriptions of buildings in the very same way. She's using them um, as examples of individualism where a single idea follows through the beginning of the design all the way through. Um, and one of my favorite and Rob's favorite um, descriptions in the building in the book is about the uh, most beautiful building competition um, where um, it, she describes that, or is it Howard Rourke who's see. actually using the, the line, you, a building cannot borrow parts of another another building, another, another soul, a person. This can. is a, a building can't borrow chunks of another building the way a man can't borrow chunks of another person's soul. Yes, um, and there's actually um, that there is there is a link to a, a real life example in that particular uh, um, detail in the history of architecture. Um, at the time that Ayn Rand was, um, she had been working in Chicago. Um, when she first came to the U.S. When she first came to the U.S. And shortly after she left Chicago, there was. Um, the um, a, a very similar title. I, I'm the most beautiful uh, the, building in the world. The most, <laughs> and it was for the Tribune Tower. And what is really interesting, if any of you have a chance to go to the Tribune Tower in Chicago, walk around and notice that throughout this building, there are chunks literally plunked into the side of the building of other buildings from throughout like, architectural history with like a little a, plaque. A, sto a stone for the Parthenon. And, yeah, Chartres Cathedral. And they have little descriptions, little plaques underneath of them. So this is a literal example that she probably saw of a building borrowing a chunk from another building. So <laughs> even when it comes to the descriptions of the buildings, you will see that she uses them as examples um, of what individualism can and can mean and what it really doesn't mean. So, uh, Brian, uh, I think that was a fantastic question. Um, and I, I think, yeah, go ahead. It's such a great question. I want I to throw in something here because there's, there's a scene that very, so very directly answers to this. This was one where Howard Work tells us the meaning of life. He actually says it in those terms. He's talking with- It's uh, not 42? No, it's not 42. Uh, Boy, that's an obscure reference. Uh, I'm supposed to make those references. Um, but no, there's a scene where he's talking with um, Gail Winan. And he says, do you want to know the meaning of life? And Gail says, of course. You know, so he says, he goes up, he takes a branch down from a tree. He says, there, I, there was something that existed in nature. I took it down and now I can bend it into any shape I need to make something. And that's the, see, that's the, that's the meaning of life. So the, that's very much Ayn Rand's view. It goes through the, the Atlas Shrugged as well the idea of taking what's given to you in nature and coming up with a new way of using it, a new way of, of shaping it to, to fit your needs, a new idea for how it can be changed in order to, to suit the needs of your life. That's what she sees as the meaning of life, as the substance that you give to your life and as a substance you give to your identity as an individual, is how can I encounter the world around me, nature, and change it or alter it or come up with some new idea of how I can use the materials I find there to create something new that will be useful and, and, and uh, serve my needs and interests. Um, so again, uh, let, let me add one more thing. Um, I would definitely recommend reading the book itself because the book is about this concept of individualism. And what art does is that the art actually shows you. So instead of kind of saying, okay, this is what it is, it will show you, it will demonstrate to you. Uh, it will demonstrate to you kind of the different vari variations of it. it. It will show you how it operates when it is faced with conflict. It will show you what its limits are. It will show different characters talking about it and reacting to each other. So that's, I mean, that, that's the whole theme of the, of the novel. And so I would recommend reading it because it is, it's, it's kind of like it's explained or not explained. It is demonstrated, it is showed by providing this entire story and entire cast of characters to, 
to illustrate the point. Next up is going to be Joe, followed by Jyoti. Joe, go ahead. I was wondering, actually, you, if you could expand upon the idea that we're morally obligated to our individualism. Like, and she speaks about this with her objectivism type of uh, philosophy. And I never really thought, like, I felt that that was, like, too dogmatic as far as, you know, is, you know, you're morally obligated just as you're morally obligated to somebody else. You know, I don't necessarily see that, you know, where I, I almost felt like she's kind of removing individualism by forcing you to be an individual to a certain degree um, and not necessarily uh, um, have any kind of form of the collective uh, thinking at all. Um, and I think that that's problematic at a certain point. But I was wondering if you could explain that a little bit more to me, because that's something that never, and it's been a very long time since I've read Ayn Rand or studied her philosophy. So it's, I'm a bit ignorant in this area, but that's something that I remember that didn't necessarily resonate with me. Well, I, I've got a direct- I, I don't- All right, unless you would to... uh, let, Let's go, Maritza followed by Rob. Maritza, go ahead. I. I don't think it's a matter of her forcing um, individuality down our throats. Um, she, because while individuality or individualism is a central theme, it's, it's just more than that. It's, um, you know, integrity. Integrity is the ability to stand by an idea that presupposes the ability to think. And thinking is something that one doesn't borrow or pawn. And if these things are true, well, then it just flows naturally into individualism. So while individualism is the result, that's not what is actually being presented here in the art of the novel. The, the presentation that's like just it's unrolled as this like, you know, in a beautiful, delicate silk cloth that's laid out before you. It's the just these primal concepts of upholding your own integrity, being true to yourself, thinking for yourself instead of taking the thoughts of others as gospel. And, and that's what I see like this. So that you, you come about and we all say individualism, but that's that's what it unrolls into. The deeper, more core aspects are subtler and they're more important, at least in, in my mind. Rob? Yeah, one of the things I would say is that, and we, this will come out a lot when we talk about, when we look at the, at the, the Romantic Manifesto, is that her purpose as an artist was not to necessarily say, you, here's what you must do, is to attract you to be towards individuals by showing if you're an individualist, look what you can accomplish. You could be like Howard Rourke. You could be like these heroes. And if you are not an individualist, if you let you know other people dictate what you do, you could end up like Peter Keating. And for God's sake, who would, who would want to do, who would want to suffer through that? You know, because he makes. I mean, Peter Peter's pretty pathetic by the end of this by the end of the story. Uh, he's he's sort of not a. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of a problem that often happens in literature. Uh, that the villain ends up being the most interesting character. <laughs> I just finished, I read recently uh, uh, Paradise Lost. And, you know, the people, one of the things they say about that John Milton's poem is that he makes Satan the most interesting character <laughs> and, and it sort of undermines his, his message of the, of the rest of the poem. Uh, but what so she does is, is that the, the villains end up looking, you know, fairly pathetic and shabby at the end. They're not attractive characters. So the fundamental thing is to to attract you with the positive of I could be, you know, if 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 you're an individualist, if you make the decisions for yourself, if you encounter the world in a firsthand way, look how much richer and more interesting it can be. Uh, but as to the issue of duty, um, uh, it, this is more of a technical philosophical thing. So you can go Google it because it's available. There's an article she wrote called "Causality versus Duty." Uh, in 1974, I think. And if you just Google causality versus duty, you should find it. It's, you can read it online. Um, and it's one where she basically describes how her ethics is not a duty-based ethics. It doesn't tell you, you must do this absolutely, or, you know, with no question. What hers is, is, a, is an ethics that says, 
if you want to achieve certain goals, then you have to, you know, then you have to do these certain things. So it's, it's very much based on a conditional one. And fundamentally is that you have to make the choice as to what kind of life you want. And then once you've made the choice, everything else follows from that. But fundamentally it comes from your choice. And so the, uh, the quote she uses there is an old Spanish proverb that said, what's it? Uh, God said, take what you want and pay for it. Mm -hmm. So you choose, you know, you choose the goals that you, that you want to pursue, but when you choose the goal, you're also in choosing all the consequences that come from it. Uh, and so, you know, the point of her ethics is to show you, here are all the consequences that come from it. And then you can decide whether that's what you really want. So if you want to drift along and let other people, you know, set your goals for you, well, here's Peter Keating. He'll show you all the consequences that come from that. So that's more the, the, the sort of the spirit or the, uh, the idea behind it. Uh, so if you're really interested in that subject, I, I start recommend that article, Causality versus Duty. Hey, can, I, can I just... A two second, I want to say just something to follow on to something Rob just said, because it, it reminded me of something specifically from the Romantic Manifesto that I think applies here um, for Joe. So in the Romantic Manifesto, Ayn Rand tells us that art is not the handmaiden for morality. Art is not to teach, but to show. And that's what she tells us the purpose of art. And I, I feel like that directly answers the question of is she forcing this upon us? Thank you. Excellent. Uh, next up is Jyoti followed by Eric. Jyoti, go ahead. Yeah, I read this book way back uh, after I graduated from the high school in India. For some reason, Fountainhead was one of the best books to be read at that age for some reason. My question is to for Rob. Uh, would you think that this was a soul-searching story, like fulfillment, your fulfillment before the pain comes, you need to know what you are all about and why you should be individual. How does your soul help you to become an individual and his contact with his four friends? And that's something that we all come in contact in everyday life, people like them, and we think about, you know, we, we question them in our mind, in the, our soul has the answers. Where, you know, you always gauge the person's actions, their agendas, their motives, and you seek questions, you, you seek answers within you. Is this the right person for me to deal with? Do I go in this direction? How do I, you know, what is this person going to do for me? Do you think, um, or I'm completely off the tangent? Yeah. No, I, think uh, I, I, I know you asked Rob to answer <laughs> and I'll let him. <laughs> okay. I promise I will. But you but, may have a better answer. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we'll, we can compare. <laughs> no, we'll tag team. Um, so I think the reason that the Fountainhead is often read at that age um, is because developmentally, that's the age where people are starting to question um, who they are really, um, but also um, how they live. And I think for that reason, this is why that this book is often read in high school when people are just starting to, to take those paths, those steps. And um, like I said, at the very beginning, um, art is it's, it's something we'll learn as we're reading the, manifest, the romantic manifesto that art is, is can be fuel, but it also can be a user manual. Um, it shows you what the natural consequences are in literature so that we don't have to live our entire lives to realize what ha what's down the road from making those decisions. So tag, okay. you're it. All right. Well, what I was going to say is that um, actually, Srikant, we had a discussion when you were visiting here. I think the last time you were visiting here, we had a discussion very much like this. Uh, and my conclusion from it was that uh, the Fountainhead or the impact of Ayn Rand is basically to have your have your midlife crisis early, <laughs> right? Because, because you know, when you see someone having a midlife crisis, what usually means is that they set their life in some direction 
when they were 18 or 20 or 22 years old, they, they chose a career, they got married, they, you know, they did all, they made all these major life choices and set their self in a certain direction. And then they reached a point later on, 20 years later, where they suddenly realized, wait a minute, is this where I really wanted to go? And oftentimes it's because people didn't think deeply about what direction they wanted to go when they were 18 or 20. They didn't have that soul searching experience. And then they end up, you know, 20 years later, having it and realizing, wait a minute, I've you know, spent 20 years working. Did I really get to a place that I'm enjoying and that I like my life? I wanted to be a painter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's, yeah, that's, that's Peter mm -hmm. Keating says, I realized this later on, he really wanted to be a painter. And he really wanted to do landscape painting. He didn't want to be an architect at all. But by the time he realizes that it's too late his life, and his life is kind of a shambles. Um, spoiler. Spo that's sorry. okay, sorry, a little bit of a spoiler. Um, he's, he's the bad guy, we know it doesn't end well for him. Uh, so, the, uh, the, so, so the way I see it is that, you know, it's a, reading the fountainhead and that and the, the, the questions that she asked and posed to you, it's a great way to have your, have your, have your midlife crisis early. Uh, a question whether, when you're 18 or 20 years old, question, what is it I really want to do in life rather than just falling into a groove that's set out for you? And actually, the part of the, the context of that was uh, in our conversation with Shrikan is that sometimes, you know, people, it, people that we knew who were objectivists had ended up being less successful in some terms uh, because of objectivism. You know, it didn't set, it didn't make them rich and it didn't, it didn't teach them how to become rich or how to become, how to make a lot of money in business because oftentimes they were directed by that to, to something that was less outwardly successful, but more in the spirit of Howard work, more, more successful in terms of what their actual values and what they wanted of life was because they were invited to ask those questions earlier on. Excellent. Good question. Thanks. Uh, next up, our last question is from Eric, and then we are going to do uh, breakout rooms. Eric, go ahead. Eric, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, unmute. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I wrote down my question. Um, well, for, first of all, I found that I identified much more with the Fountainhead than Atlas Shrugged uh, throughout my 20s. So here's a question about the Fountainhead. Um, a reader could identify with the character Rourke's sense of purpose and see themselves in it, but feel that they could never exhibit Rourke's endurance for the solitude and adversity. So my question is, what aspects of the character Rourke do you think are just part of his personality in the novel and therefore not essential to the idea of individualism or independence? Very good question. Yeah, very good question. Okay. Uh, I thought I thought Joya had uh, some insight on that, but I, I would like to hear everyone's answers. Joya, you have an insight on it. Go ahead. Well, I, I agree. That it is a very interesting question because a huge part of that is the question of the, the, the time and the era in which you were born, presumably. Uh, because I think certain of these characteristics you do need to have, but how difficult the journey would be might depend on the, the circumstances in which you find yourself. And I think you make a really great point that as we're exploring what individualism means, that to some extent individualism often does mean being different from everyone else and, and standing out and that requires resilience and, and having to live through adversity. So I think that is the big question. I, I would just say I, that for me, the Fountainhead has been inspiring because it's helped me face my own moments of adversity and have something inspiring to see, to see that vision that in the end, it, it can all be okay, that there can be that, that, you know, that point that the pain doesn't touch, that you can go through all the awful things that work goes through and still triumph in the end. Yeah. Um one thing is I meant to put, this sort of ties into the reason why I asked earlier to people what character in the fountain do you identify with? Because she actually shows different styles of an individualist reacting to the world. Like there's Henry Cameron, who's clearly an individualist in a lot of ways, but he gets over overwhelmed by anger and bitterness. He and doesn't have as much resilience. He doesn't have as much resilience. <laughs> um, or there's uh, Stephen Mallory, the sculptor, who is a sensitive artist, right? And he's He's tortured by the things that he sees in the world that that the hostility he finds in the world, 
Whereas the, the main characteristic of Howard Rourke that makes him so unusual and so different from most of from most everybody in the world is that sort of almost compl the complacency, you know, the, his ability to just be mentally untouched or emotionally untouched by encountering hostility or opposition in the world. And now, it, it, some, I think something Ritz said earlier, you know, it, it's sort of a little hard to say I identify with Howard Rourke because, you know, she makes her characters these great geniuses and, you know, so it seems a little presumptuous to say that, but that's one respect in which I did identify with Howard Rourke. And the reason for that is my sister was mean to me when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of an odd thing to say, but my sister was actually kind of mean, you, you know this. She you know was this. really mean. She was mean to me. And she'll admit that now. She was mean to me when we were kids. But one thing is that it, it, it actually helped me out tremendously because one of the things I learned to do was how to deal with hostility and how to ignore it and how to just sort of float above it. And I actually have the experience now, and, and Sherry can attest to this, that well, I, I once had a conversation with someone and then somebody later on, my, my office mate at the time said, wow, how did you deal with all, all that hostility? And I looked at her and I said, that was hostile? <laughs> you know, I, compared to my sister, that was nothing. It was, I didn't, you know, it kind of rolls water off a duck's back. And, and I couldn't work in the field of politics. You know, a lot of writing I do is in politics. I could not work in the field of politics without that skill. And it's a skill. It's like a, it's an emotional, psychological skill to be able to let hostility roll off of you. And, and most people live their lives in a way that doesn't require them to, to develop that skill. Uh, so that's why, you know, I think it, there are different models of individualism. You can be shy, more shy and sensitive, like a Seaver Mallory and be an individualist. Uh, Whereas Ayn Rand, I think, is choosing a character who has that characteristic of that unflappability, the inability to be reached by emotionally by other people's hostility, uh, that calmness in the face of it. She's doing that to underscore the underlying theme of the need to not have your life be shaped by other people. But remember also, even with Howard Rourke, he, you still see his emotion, his struggle, um, especially in his relationship with Dominique, that he mm -hmm. has to, he knows that he has to wait for her to make all these connections. Um, and it's, it's a very painful, agonizing wait for him. Um, in the real world, probably wouldn't have happened, but this is a work of fiction. Um, so she uses that as a clarifying point, um, as a crystallizing lens to show us what that really means. And just the variation of kind of possible great characters with mm -hmm. the same core can be seen very clearly in Atlas, which mm -hmm. is a much more complex work. And they have this entire palette of you know Francisco, Reardon, Galt, Ragnar, it just goes on and on. And you can see the differences in character and you can also see what is common to, to all of them. All right, folks, so now we're going to do breakout rooms for 20 minutes. Um, you can continue the discussions on whatever questions that were raised, and we'll come back in 20 minutes. And what we're going to do is we are going to give a chance for putting one question on the table. So make that question count. And then we'll take all the questions together and look at the patterns in it and just deal with the most kind of uh, you know, just the large patterns of questions there. All right, so I'm starting the breakout rooms now and we'll be back here in 20 minutes. We are going to now talk about the best question that you have, okay? <laughs> um, and then we're going to go ahead and um, we're going to answer them. Okay, so that's, that's the plan. I'm gonna call on you in the order in which I see you folks um, and when, if you want to skip, you're welcome to skip. And then we're going to take all the questions together. And then we're going to discuss, you know, them together. Okay, with the panel. What so that's, time are we ending this though? I thought it goes till 11. What time did you have in mind to? Who's speaking? Uh, Lloyd. Lloyd, it's up to you. You can leave whenever you want, Lloyd. Okay, but uh, I thought it was going till 11. You advertised till 11. Yes, I mean, we advertise and then the people want to talk. So people talk when, when up to whenever and people leave whenever. So 
that's that's the that's how it works. Uh, so, folks, um, uh, I'm going to call on the people in which uh, order in which I see people, and we'll put all the questions on the table, and we'll go from there. So, uh, it's going to be Victor, Eric, and Brian Park. Victor, go ahead. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, it's been uh, a while. I read uh, Fountainhead, and uh, I still remember as it uh, as I read it uh, like yesterday. So, my question would be, how do you see Ayn Rand's fiction work in terms of literature? So in literature, there is a fundamental idea of having a character arc, a character traveling through a certain time and space in external and internal world. And uh, at the end, the character actually ends up in a different place. So in terms of that, in terms of her protagonists, how do you see that? Or, or do you see her work uh, as a literature or is she using the literature to make her point? Wonderful, excellent question. Uh, we, we're gonna take all the questions and then we're gonna answer them all together, okay? Uh, next up actually, and anybody who wants to skip the line and uh, you know ask a question uh, earlier, you can go ahead and type exclamation mark. So next is going to be David, Eric, and Brian Park. David, go ahead. Okay, I've unmuted myself. Look, it was just the question we were dealing with. Rob was about to answer me in our breakout room. Um, I was suggesting um, tentatively that there's a, a basic contradiction within Ayn Rand between the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Uh, in the Fountainhead, it seems to me we're putting forward a form of uh, artistic elitism, or let's say, you know, the, the architect wins, the artist, the skill, the creator wins. Uh, uh, he defies the people, he defies the market. And yet, to me, and I may be wrong, the message of Atlas Shrugged is that the market is supreme. Okay. Everybody, Fantastic. ultimate democracy, everybody votes with their dollar. The market excellent. rules, you see. Excellent. And <laughs> uh, uh, David, excellent question. So is it is it the primacy of creator or primacy of market? I'll put, put the question as that. Great, uh, thank let's you. Go to the next one. Um, so it's going to be Eric, followed by Brian Park, followed by Jeff. Eric. Okay, um, another written down question. So I think that Ayn Rand said that she had a lot to learn in between writing We the Living and The Fountainhead. And I think that was about technique, but I gather it was also about philosophy from her journal writing. And my question is, do you know of something that she only discovered for herself after writing The Fountainhead that went into Atlas Shrugged? Excellent Some question. Philo a, a philosophical idea that she did not have in the forties. Excellent, excellent question. Next up is Brian Park, uh, Jeff, and Brian Allen P. Brian, go ahead. What defines a person the most? Okay. Is it their ethics, their values, their accomplishments? What is it? Excellent, excellent question. Uh, next up is Jeff, Brian, and Paul. Jeff. So um, I asked my, my question, uh, to the panelists, assuming that we are going to seek to have the most productive and and uh, and you know compassionately uh, ruthless uh, d uh, disagreement we could possibly have regarding this question, what is your definition of an individual, of, okay. a, of an individualist? Okay. Um, Got it. And and really, what I'm interested in is what are your criteria for define for that definition that are be, that it's satisfying. Okay, what is what is the definition of individualist? Next up is Brian, Paul, and uh, Hiro. Brian, Brian Allen, go ahead. Okay, I, I don't actually have a question. I'm, I'm as I explained in the breakout room. I I'm here to learn. Okay. Um, I I only heard of Ayn Rand about five years ago. I've never come across her before then, so I'm I'm just here to learn. Sure. Sure, you're, you're well, anybody is welcome to pass. Uh, next up is uh, Paul, 
Uh, let me see, Paul, whom did I say? Paul, Hiro, and Lloyd. Paul, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I know who is Howard uh, Rourke in our group. Um, that's definitely Maritza. And, uh, but um, for the panel, is anybody in this year in 2020, would you from any public person or known person, would you, uh, would you call somebody Howard Rourke of our time? Okay, very good. Public figure who is like Howard Rourke, okay. Uh, next up is Hiro, Lloyd and Joe. Hiro? Mm -hmm. I think Paul stole my question. <laughs> kind of like that. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, could it be Elon Musk or someone like that? Like who, who could be the ideal individualist that's pushing the boundary that, that uh, everyone around him is kind of uh, following the trends? Sure. Thank you. Next up is uh, Lloyd, Joe, and Dave. Um, just piggybacking on my previous question, I would just say in a situation where a person couldn't afford to refuse jobs, um, needed the money for their family, pay their rent, etc., cetera, um, would you still be an individualist if you were able to compromise a little on your design, not trashing it, but would you still be considered an individualist if you could be open to some kind of compromise in your designs to, you know, keep your keep the job? Excellent. Uh, thanks, Lloyd. Uh, next up is Joe, Dave, and Marco. Joe? So I'm just going to be like a little bit different than Jeff's question and to just build on it is the um, once you define what an individual is, you know, how does Ayn Rand define it at her point in time? And how would we define individualism today? And I know that Rob had already kind of answered that and said it, stay, it stays the same. But I do think that there are some things that uh, probably changed uh, within the knowledge-based economy versus an industrial-based economy. Uh, thank you, Joel. Next up is Dave. Marco and Mike. Dave? Uh, thanks, Shikant, and thanks for panel for giving a nice presentation. I think I watched a movie based on the Fountainhead many moons ago, uh, so I don't know the details, so I will be going along for the ride. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Next up is uh, Marco, Mike, and Hugo. Uh, skip. Okay. Next up is uh, Mike, uh, Hugo, and Kevin. Mike, uh, the, your your uh, simplification of my question, I think, is still relevant because of the uh, uh, the gross discontinuity of how life how life is uh, about to change as uh, technology approaches a singularity. Everything from What's morality to government, uh, and how is that going to affect us? Morality, government, life, economics. Um, and uh, the nature of work and money is uh, about to uh, change, which will... Got it. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin and Hugo. Kevin, go ahead. Kevin. Um, I know the individual could be the hero. Um, my question is... Uh, um, oh, I want to start with my question. Uh, my question... Uh, Oh, my question is, let's see the boss in the workplace, when the boss tell you, Kevin, you cannot change the world. What's my ideal answer uh, to be myself, to be honest, what I should do? Thank you. Okay. Very good. Uh, so the limits of what you can change, you can't change the world, you're saying. Okay, next up, um, I think we've gone through everything. So um, here's what I'm going to do, uh, panelists. So what I want to do is I want to do like a lightning round and we were just going to go, run through the questions and answer, you know, go ahead. You, you can just, uh, panelists, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and answer any of the questions. So let's start with uh, Victor. I'm just going to go in, in order. I think that's pretty, pretty good. These are very interesting range of questions. 
First one, what is Ayn Rand doing with her literature? What, what, what is the sequence of what happens to characters and what does that mean? And what, I what something, is the literature of Ayn Rand? Sorry, I, I have something to say about this. And I, oh. I think it even directly ties to the point that I was making before about how she has a, I think it was an aesthetic preference for this idea of, of characters staying the same and that this was crucial to her idea of the hero, that the hero stays the same. But then this posed a really interesting problem for her novels, because if the heroes are essentially going to be the same, then what's driving the action? So one of the interesting things I think you see in different ways in both The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged is that even though the main heroes stay the same, the drama is often driven by their love interests and the other people around them who are changing in response to the hero. Excellent. Next question. We're going to go uh, very rapidly through everything. Just anybody who wants to, any of the panelists who wants to answer the question can just unmute, answer the question, we'll go to the next one, and then we'll uh, do a discussion, uh, kind of do follow up. Okay. okay. Half a sentence on that one. I think go ahead. the how it's right. Howard work does not really have a big character arc the same way other people do, except I think the one thing he does that's different and goes out of his routine is his relationship with Gail Wyant. Mm -hmm. And that's where you see yeah. The real adventure in his character is, is his reaction to Gail Wynand, who's seemingly his opposite, but he, he admires him and you know there's that friendship there. And let me just throw in as the architect, all arcs have a center point that everything rotates around. And Howard Rourke is that center point. Oh, nice. Okay, excellent. So. Uh, so f folks, feel free. I think you're, you're being very short, so just anybody can jump in. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, the next question is, is uh, given the difference between Fountainhead and Atlas Shrug, is Ayn Rand a champion of the creator or the market? Right, so I Definitely to... the creator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, you know, the if you look at the character of um, uh, Hank Reardon, you see that it's the same, very much the same thing as Howard Rourke. Mm -hmm. He's the guy with the innovative new idea that nobody wants to touch. Mm -hmm. And it's only because he finds a client who's a customer who's daring enough. And that's, you know, Dagny Tiger's big innovation is she's daring enough to say, yes, I'm going to use Rudin metal when nobody else will touch it. So she's dealing with the same issue, I think. And you see that even in The Fountainhead towards the end of the novel, Howard Rourke isn't penniless. He's <laughs> yeah. actually overwhelmed with a number of commissions. I agree that she is talking about the same theme, but it's like, look, bigger picture. She's talking about thinking for yourself, being true to your own individual self is what she's getting at. And that's from when she gets the innovator, the creator. What's the difference between Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged? Uh, what is it that she learned? What are the fundamental principles mm -hmm. that she learned between Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged? I'll jump in on this too. So the first part of the question was even, he, he noticed there was a distinction between We the Living and the Fountainhead and then the Fountainhead to Atlas Shrugged. So one of the big things I wanted to say about the jump between We the Living and the Fountainhead, I think Gail Winded is one of the most interesting characters in all of Ayn Rand's corpus because he represents an error I believe she made and then corrected once she grasped explicitly the concept of the second hander because when you look at all the earlier fiction, when she says explicitly that she wasn't yet ready to write her ideal man, the, the clearest example is a play she wrote just before this where the, the, the hero never even appears on stage, but you could describe that character, Bjorn Faulkner, in this play, Night, Night of January the 16th. You could describe him as a cross between a Howard Rourke and a Gail Winand, but almost more of a Gail Winand because he's very interested in, in going after power. So I think one of the biggest jumps is when she grasps the concept of the second hander and she recognizes is that going after power is not pursuit. And then between the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, she had lots of ideas. So uh, one of the big ones was she has a concept of life as a standard of value, which she says she didn't even get until she was writing the big speech at the end. Uh, her concept of free will, her theory of universals, uh, the idea of the hatred of the good for being good. Those were all big ideas between the Fountainhead and, and Atlas. And all of that is a, a natural progression because um, living with a writer, I understand that the act of writing is a thinking process. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so as she wrote, she got more careful, more depth in her thinking and in her philosophy. And, and the worst thing in the world is the great idea and perfect conclusion you come up with 15 minutes after you posted the article. <laughs> she formalizes, she formalizes the um, importance of um, our virtues as from book to book to book, it gets more obvious and less like more defined as it were, less subtle. Well, I also think that the big thing, the difference I see between the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged is the specifically this idea of the creator versus the market that somebody just brought up, which is that she, yeah, I, I think it's interesting that, that her novels kind of track her life because when she's writing The Fountainhead, she was young intellectual just starting out, right? And uh, she had the concerns of a young intellectual just starting out, like what what should I be doing? How should I, how all of these demands to compromise my work? And, and she's, she's looking at things from the perspective of a creator after the at Fountainhead, she was very successful and she was spending a lot of time dealing with people in the business world. And she was you know, ready to sort of deal with the, the sort of more middle-aged, I guess I would say, uh, issues of what's the marketplace like. And you know, she, she knew a bunch of these big publishers and a bunch of businessmen and trying to deal with what is the realities of the market and the operation of capitalism and trying to take the ideas she had in Fountainhead and expand them into developing the economics of it and figuring out, you know, how does this, how did, how does this, how did this, this insight about the importance of the individual creator, how does that apply to the economy as a whole? And it's this perspective she didn't have uh, in the Fountainhead. Okay. Uh, what uh, defines a person? Is it their values, uh, their thoughts? Uh, what is it that defines a person? Yes, that's my answer. It is your values, it is your thoughts. And I think taking that deeper, I, th I think it's the philosophy, which it can be the explicit philosophy if, but there's also, I think a part, um, we'll get into the sense of life some in the Romantic Manifesto. I personally see the sense of life almost as your implicit philosophy. It's it's that built up through emotional experiences of your lifetime. Um, it's what drives your emotions. And I think it's the combination of the two that really um, is what, what defines a person, how they react to a situation, what they value and what they ultimately respond to what decisions they make. What I'm going to do is that the biggest question in this is the question of, you know, what is it? What is individualism mm -hmm. that I'm keeping at the end? Um, so I'm going to handle all the other ones and then uh, we'll, we'll come back to this one. Um, so the next question is what public figure most resembles Howard Rock? Oh, because it's easier to think of all the ones that don't. <laughs> all right. Of course, I read about politics and politicians are always the opposite of yeah. the first hand. Yeah. So all right, let, let's skip that one. Uh, I feel like you'd have uh, to say Ayn Rand herself, obviously. <laughs> uh, next okay. one. Dang. Go ahead. I just think it's a really interesting question, but I'm I'm not I'm trying to think who the answer would be. And not Elon Musk. He's too skin, he's too Victor thin. Victor will come come back. We're going to do this round and then we're going to come back. If if we're thinking of architects currently around, I would throw the hat in the ring for Santiago Calatrava. Okay. Excellent. Yes, very um, great event. Unusual. Last two questions. Um, what happens when you have to compromise a little bit on your design? We got into this discussion in our uh, breakout and there's a couple different things and I can speak of this as an architect. There's sometimes when there is an issue that comes up that changes the design um, and it's not, it, it, it's, it's it depends on how you look at it, whether it's a compromise. You, maybe you run into bedrock <laughs> and it's suddenly um, the cost of the project um, becomes astronomical to break through bedrock. So there are times when it makes sense to make a change because of the reality of the situation. Maybe you've got a client who suddenly you've designed a building and all of a sudden the parameters change. It, maybe it's a house, you need more bedrooms, fewer bedrooms, 
the budgets change, things like that. That is, that's, that's real life. And I don't think those are really compromises. Um, she doesn't describe those in her novel because she's not a naturalist in her work. Um, but I think you're actually getting at um, true compromises. And I think it gets into um, what is the core of the idea that's behind what you're creating. You have to not do um, it. For example, if you do say the world's most beautiful building, that building in Chicago that has chunks of other buildings in it, um, every time you do that, um, and, and not in that very ex exact example, but every time you make that compromise, um, it's just a little bit easier to do it again. Uh, it's like the first time you skip school, you know, uh, it's really easy to skip school the next time and the next, it becomes a habit. And I think that's part of the problem is that you have to be really careful to balance those. If it becomes a habit to be doing those kinds of things, then you're really looking at farther down the road and suddenly realizing what that very first compromise that you made, how costly it really, really was. Well, you've had a- if, yeah. can, can, I'm sorry, can I just very quickly, yeah. Hoya, Hoya brought, mentioned the scene in the Fountain Head with the tree branch that Howard work took and showed it to show life. He showed how you could bend it and shape it. So my response to that question would be, find a way to bend that branch without breaking it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I also gotta say that, you know, sometimes you just gotta quit your job over on a principle. Uh, and I've done it, you know, I, uh, you know, example, you know, like for, if you're an accountant, right? So the, let's pick a job where artistic vision doesn't come into it. There's, you know, an accountant doesn't deal with artistic vision, he deals mm -hmm. with numbers. But at the same time, if you have a client who's asking you to fudge the numbers, right? <laughs> who's yeah. asking you to to uh, uh, to dishonestly present the state of his business so he can get a loan or something like that. At some point, you just got to say, no, I quit. I won't do this because the consequences for you, you're going to get dragged down by that. Uh, and your reputation for honesty is more important. And so this gets back to what Rob was talking about early on. Um, their punishment is they have to live with who they are. Yeah. If you make too many compromises, it's that there's eroding at the deep fabric of your soul. Yeah. But uh, you know, the thing is, it, it, it's different for every job, and it may not be artistic vision; it may yeah. be the honesty of the numbers. But there's always, you know, there's always a choice, a point you have to make that decision of what's what's a compromise that's a small thing that it doesn't really matter, and I can do it versus what's a deal breaker. Okay. Um, last question, and then we we're going to go going to the. I want to do two things after this. So last question is, what do you say to someone who says, you know, as an individual, you can't really change the world? What is your response to that? I ran Don't, change the world with her books. She was an individual. If you're worrying about the world, your perspective is turned the wrong way. Look inward, change yourself. And as you change yourself, someone else will change themselves. And hopefully the next person will change themselves. That's how we change the world. You change the world by changing yourself. Don't worry about the world. Change yourself. Okay. And, yeah, and I would add just that the, the you know, we, we don't live in the, middle, in the Middle Ages anymore, right? Yeah, so you're not a surf on a, on a, on a giant, you're not a surf serving the, man, the manorial uh, lord. Uh, you know, you actually have a lot of ability to change your, to choose your circumstances. So if you find yourself in, in terrible, you know, so I think the, the question was, you're at a job and your boss is telling you, to, you know, telling you to do things you don't like. Uh, you do have the ability, you know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but you do have the ability to decide, you know what, I'm going to go out in the market. I'm going to find a different job. I'm going to move on. I can going to change the circumstances in which I've been put. And, you know, it's not changing the whole world, but you can change, you can make changes in your part of the world. Okay. And I think part of one of Ayn Rand's big messages is don't underestimate how much you can change by changing what your, your, mm -hmm. your, your, your outlook on things in your, your part of the world. 
Okay, excellent. So what I want to do is I want to briefly talk about what we are going to be doing on Saturdays, uh, the Romantic Manifesto. And then we will try to deal with the core question, which is actually at the heart of Ayn Rand's philosophy, which is at the heart of this book. It's a difficult dis discussion, but I think I want to try it. But I want to first talk about what, what's coming up. So I think, I mean, the reason, you know, I chose Romantic Manifesto is that I think it's by far my favorite book by Ayn Rand. And it's not surprising because, you know, she was primarily her purpose was to create, you know, Howard Rourke or create John Gott uh, to portray an ideal. And art was the means through which she did it. And um, so her entire life was about that. And so core of her thought was how do you make that happen? So everything else that she thought of, things like, you know, how do you think? How do you, what values do you hold? How does, how do you deal with other people? Um, all of the questions were in the context of literature, of art. And in Romantic Manifesto, she just basically shows you how, how her art works and how art as such works. Secondly, she's a proponent of, uh, an exponent of romanticism. It's a school uh, which is um, not, you know, uh, it used to be, it's like a 19th century school. People like Victor Hugo, uh, people like that. Um, and that has something to offer to us. Um, and I, so those are the two reasons that I think romanticism has something to offer to the culture. And these are the deepest ideas of Ayn Rand that I can, I can find. Um, so that's why I'm excited about studying it because in understanding art, you're actually bringing together almost everything. Um, so that's why I'm studying it. So uh, we can just go um, one by one, who wants to go next? Uh, so uh, any of the panelists, you can say, why Romantic Manifesto? Why, why look at Romantic Manifesto? And uh, folks, uh, just before, before that, um, I want to show you the, uh, I want to tell you the pattern. What we are going to do this Saturday is we are going to do an introduction to Romantic Manifesto. We are, whatever we are saying now in one minute each or one to two minutes each, we are going to expand fully of saying, okay, what is art? We'll look at what is art? What does it offer to human beings? What is Ayn Rand's approach to art? What is Romanticism's approach to art? How is it different from other schools of art? Um, and why is it worth looking at? So that's what we're going to do next Saturday. Then we'll take a two week break because of Thanksgiving. And then we will continue the series. We'll, we are going to go through this book chapter by chapter to understand it. This is a very deep work on aesthetics. So that's what we're going to be doing. So who, who would like to go next? You know, one to two minutes on why, why are you interested in looking at Romantic Manifesto? So my personal interest is I think the concept of sense of life that she deals with there, it's the only place she really goes in depth into this concept of sense of life. I think it's tremendously important. It's, a, it, it's sort of a psychological bedrock of, of, your, of your life, you know, that you can, and I've seen this, that you can decide such something as, a, as the rational course of action to take. And you've got all the arguments, but if it goes against your sense of life, it's going to be extremely hard to do that thing. And, uh, so that the, and I think it is possible to, to, to change or to reshape your sense of life if you find it's a problem, but understanding how a sense of life is formed, what it is, how it affects your action, I think that's hugely important. And that's really the, the underlying philosophical issue and psychological issue that she's dealing with. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a book about art or it's a book about literature and more broadly about art. But underneath that is that psychological and philosophical issue of what is the sense of life? How does it affect you? How is it formed? And how could it potentially be, be influenced or changed? Wonderful. And just, just for reference, I mean, sense of life is basically implicit philosophy. That is the, the philosophy on which you are acting and what informs your emotions and your actions. Uh, next, uh, who would like to go next? Um, I would say one of the real reasons I think it's important to study a work like the Romantic Manifesto is because 
I think everybody has that sense sometime in their life when a work of art, whether it's fiction, music, sculpture, paintings, architecture, whatever it is, that has had a deeply, profoundly moving impact on your life. Um, and that is the potential art has for us, that it's fuel for our soul, but it can also be a user manual for how to get to a state of greater happiness and understanding how art does that, how and why it does that, I think allows you to take it from, you know, low grade fuel to jet fuel. And that is a really wonderful ability to be able to do that for yourself. Wonderful. Uh, Marisa or Joya? Um, to answer your question, why the Romantic Manifesto? It's the, to see in black and white, the expression that there is um, rational and reason in art is just a beautiful thing. To know that there is meaning and to share as you go through the book, the, the very vivid reality that one can express one's virtues in the matter of art is, it's just, it's not something that a lot of people are saying. It's not something you see often. And I just, you know, Ayn, Ayn Rand tells us that in art, the artist is telling us, this is life as I see it. And then the artist invites the viewer to say, this is, or this is not life as I see it. And I think that those are super powerful. Excellent. Julia? I'll just type back to what I said at the beginning that one of the aspects of Ayn Rand's work and the Fountainhead in particular that's always inspired me is this vision of the human being as a creator. And in the Romantic Manifesto, we get to see Ayn Rand's own thoughts about what it was for her to be a creator. So I'm super excited we're gonna go through this work in depth. Excellent, excellent folks. So now we're going to deal with the toughest of the question and which is really the heart of Ayn Rand's philosophy and this book. Um, so the question is... Srikant? Yes. Could I just ask you a quick question? Is there a cost for the workshop? And is the first one free to see if we want to do it or not? How long is the workshop? How many weeks? Um, uh, firstly, there, it's all free. Uh, we do these meetups every day and all the meetups are free. Um, and uh, there is no cost. It's going to be uh, chapter by chapter. I think there are 11 chapters. So it's going to be introduction this week, at, you know, the, uh, on Saturday, followed by 11 chapters. Uh, it covers things like psychoepistemology of art. How does it work within you? What is the relationship between philosophy and art? Uh, what are the different kinds of schools of art? Um, what is the purpose? What is the nature of plots? And what is the nature of characters? It's going to go into all of that. Okay, uh, I recommend that you get the book and read it. Uh, if, even if you have read it before, reread it. I actually have a Marathi translation in manuscript format. So I'm going to be reading uh, side by side um, English and Marathi, which actually uh, I found that doing that for complex works, using concepts from two different languages, it makes you think more because you don't get kind of caught up into any kind of terminology that you're using. You're saying, okay, wait a minute, how do you say it? And what kind of connotations does it, is that the, are those the right connotations in the process? It's kind of like holding the same thing, one with right hand and one with left hand, you get a better grip on it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, all right, so that's, that's what is coming up. Okay, so let's take the concept of this. So I'm going to start with Rob. Rob, what is individualism? Well, I think Ayn Rand, her big breakthrough in the fountainhead, which I think gets to the fundamental issue, is the idea of first hand versus second hand. 
the idea of, of a direct, of getting your ideas and your values from direct contact and observation with reality, your mind encountering the world and not from other people providing it for you or falling into some you know, prefabricated path uh, provided by others or stealing uh, or being influenced by other people's emotions. Uh, the idea of choosing your values and your ideas and your course of action based on your direct confrontation with the facts of reality rather than being influenced by others. Excellent. So folks, this is now our conversation. So um, if you want to speak, just type an exclamation mark and I'll call upon to, you to speak. Okay, we are talking about what is individualism? What is the nature of individualism? David. Oh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point out on this subject um, in um, Ayn Rand's uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, there are two chapters dealing specifically with this topic. Uh, chapter 18 called... Um, counterfeit individualism and chapter five isn't everyone selfish the only uh, um, um, query uh, uh, is that um, uh, both both are written by Nathaniel Brandon in uh, the virtue of selfishness And, and, and simply put, I suppose it's, um, uh, you know, um, uh, doing what you desire to do might not be in your rational self-interest. So you're not really an individual just by following your whims or your desires, your, your wishes, because... Uh, you know, that, that they can perhaps be counterproductive unless you give them some thought, uh, rationally work out whether they are or are not in your interest to, uh, to, to, to follow. Thank you, David. Uh, Jeff, did you want to elaborate on your question further? Or uh, Joe, did you want to elaborate on your questions? Um, Joe, go ahead. Uh, not particularly, but okay. I, I mean, this idea, though, firsthand and secondhand, um, I mean, aren't you being closed in if you're only looking at things from, you know, a firsthand perspective? I mean, it, you're telling me like that nothing comes from a secondhand perspective. At some point, um, you know, even our ability to draw analogies and things like that, they don't come from just ourselves. They come from interactions with others. That's what, if I could, you know, does that make sense? If I can jump in here real quick. Um, the, one of the, in my discussion breakout room, one of the people there mentioned uh, the question of, um, you know, sometimes it's good to work in a group. And what I, I stated was, let's not confuse community with collectivism. It's, the best way to work for the improvement of the group is to from from outside from within first and it flows out now you're you're saying i mean i i believe your view of first hand versus second hand it's it's not quite the the view that i see when I, i'm looking at the fountainhead and the expression of them She's not describing a second hander as, I mean, I'm sorry, a first hander as somebody who only looks to themselves. That's evidenced in the fact that Howard Work knows that he doesn't have the right skills and he seeks out, you know, Cameron and he seeks out people who, from whom he can learn. It's not a matter of never looking to anyone else that makes you a first hander. It's a matter of you are not seeking validation from others in a principle that is your own. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Let, let, me, let me put it uh, another way. I think um, it's a question of whether you kind of have an independent judgment. I think man is 
deeply social being. We learn so much, you know, we draw so much on existing uh, civilization. We work with other people in order to produce things. So interaction with others is, a, is an integral part of who we are. So the question is not whether we interact with other people or not. The, the question is whether you have an independence of judgment. Do you, do you substitute kind of just the judgment of others without asking questions or whether you evaluate things yourself? And it, so it's like there are, there are places like you can see it in a tribal culture where the kind of the emotions of the tribe kind of dominate the individual so that there is no kind of individual initiative. And what she's pointing out is that in order to build things, you need that individual initiative. And then you can work with that initiative. You can you know, figure out the right way of dealing with people and work with people on a larger scale. So she would say that, you know, for example, in this large complex economy that we have, each person exercising their judgment makes a scale of working together possible, which is just not possible if everybody is simply reacting to people. So that, that's, how, that's how I see it. Okay, anybody else? I, I, Go ahead. I would throw in on, uh, on the issue of, of getting ideas from others. Yeah, the learning from others is tremendously valuable, but it's the difference between like, you know, to actually learn from somebody else, to actually learn a new idea. It has to come from the other person and then you have to make it your own by seeing it firsthand, by understanding exactly what is the basis of this idea. By, by understanding it in your own mind, uh, you know, it, it comes from somebody else's mind, you have to understand it in your own. Like, for example, if I asked you, what's an electron? And you give me a definition, I can memorize the definition. But if I don't know what the definition, what the words in the definition refers to, if I don't know any of the facts or the background, all I have is a bunch of memorized words, I don't have knowledge, right? So I'd have to actually go like understand for myself what is, you know, you have to, you'd have to, a good teacher would be able to bring me to the point where I can understand for my own self, what is the basis? What is the meaning of each of these words? What is it actually referred to? And, you know, what does it mean in reality? And I would have a firsthand understanding as opposed to just, you know, parroting back what somebody told me to say. I think it's a nice way to explain it as um, it's whether or not you are doing the processing, the thinking yourself. I, I've once heard somebody say it's whether it's it, if you if you were to compare it to digestion, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's whether or not your own stomach is doing the digesting or whether you're letting somebody else's stomach do that digestion for you. You have to do that process in your head. Somebody else can't do that for you. Unless, of course, this whole um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence thing comes to fruition and then we can all plug our brains together. Uh, until that, you tell, you until, that, until the board comes along, um, all that thinking process has to happen in our own heads. And you're doing it right now by asking that question. Um, I want to, I want to uh, approach it another way. Uh, from the, by way of values. It's saying that each person has to say what is of value to me and what is virtue. And then actually find people who share those values and virtues to work with. So it's a community in the opposite way. You simply say, this group of people that I'm with have these values and they regard these as virtues and I will just do that. So it's a very passive way of accepting it. Uh, and those communities are very limited communities. These are very small communities. And those are usually at war with each other because they are all based on that, uh, almost an accident of, of the circumstance that they, they have formed that way. The communities of choice that are based on kind of individuals choosing values and finding individuals who share those values and virtues actually are scalable because you're saying, you know, if a person is virtuous, I'll work with them. 
if we are working towards the same values, I will work for them. It doesn't matter what their background is, what the familiar, if you, so that it, so individualism, individualism in values and virtues and thinking makes possible a scale unheard of. And that's what the, you know, global economy that we're talking about. We talked about uh, Buck Minister Fuller, and he was talking about the transition of these great traders, as opposed to, you know, kind of hunter gatherers or farmers who were kind of limited to their geography and followed their values of those local things. People, traders who could go between those things had a larger perspective and they were able to create a lot more value for everybody by connecting those things. It's the same issue. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else has any questions? Okay, folks, this has been amazing. Thank you very much. And I invite you to get uh, the Romantic Manifesto. Uh, it's a great book. Um, even if you have not read Ayn Rand, um, you know, her fiction, it's a very deep take on what art is. Um, it was interesting. Sherry was saying to me, it said, you know, it's, it's about literature because she's been thinking about it because she's a, uh, you know, architect. She's always think about, thinking about it in terms of visual art. And I have thought about it a lot in terms of music and all of it. It's all about art. You know, what is art and how does it work and what does it do for you? So uh, look forward to joining you. This is going to be Saturday at what time did we say? 2.30, 2.30. 2.30 Eastern time. All right. Uh, Eastern time. All right, folks. Thank you very much.